Hi guys, welcome to this video on muscle roles and contraction types. Now there's lots of different roles that muscles can play in the body and there's several different types of contraction as well. What we're going to do in this video is we're going to put them together to give us a good understanding of how we move, how we produce movement with our bodies. Don't forget to like the video and having done that, let's get started. So the first muscle role we want to talk about uh, in this lesson is the agonist, the agonist. Now we sometimes refer to the agonist as the prime mover and that name the prime mover gives you a slightly better understanding of what the role of the agonist is. Essentially in any movement whichever muscle it is that's predominantly responsible for moving that joint, for creating that movement, we refer to that muscle as being the agonist. Now it's not a specific muscle, lots of different muscles can play the role of the agonist, it depends on which movement we're talking about. But the agonist is whichever muscle in that movement is predominantly responsible for making that movement. And that's why sometimes we, recall, we, we call it the prime mover. Now in order for the agonist to create movement around a joint, you'll remember from um, previous videos that we learned how that the agonist is usually paired up with another muscle that sits on the opposite side of the joint and makes the opposite contraction or makes the opposite movement. So we have an agonist and an antagonist. An agonist and an antagonist. And these usually come in pairs. And these muscles, these are these are muscle rolls, these muscles will sit on either side of the joint in order to make the opposing movement to one another. So we have an agonist on one side of the joint making one movement. The antagonist sits on the other side of the joint and usually when it contracts will make the opposite movement to the agonist. So they come in pairs generally speaking. Now what's important to know here is that in order for the agonist to be able to contract and produce movement in a joint, the antagonist has to relax to allow the movement of the agonist. Because if they're opposing move, movements, if they're muscles that produce opposing movements, we can't have them both doing the same. We can't have them both contracting at the same time uh, and trying to move that joint in opposite directions. They're, they're working against one another in that case. So for, for the agonist to produce a movement, the antagonist has to relax to allow the agonist to make a movement. We'll do some examples in just a moment. So the agonist contracts. And in order for the agonist then to move the joint that it's working on, the antagonist, its opposing muscle, has to relax to allow that movement. Now the antagonist may not fully relax, but it will relax in comparison to the agonist so that the movement can be controlled and the movement can actually take place. Another muscle role or uh, alongside the agonist and the antagonist is a, a muscle role that assists the agonist. So the agonist may be the prime mover, well is the prime mover in any movement, but there are also often other muscles, other smaller muscles nearby the agonist assisting the agonist in the agonist's work. So the agonist is, is the prime mover predominantly in charge of the contraction, predominantly in charge of the movement of the joint. But often there are other, usually smaller muscles around the agonist or near the agonist, near that same joint that are helping the agonist with its work. So the agonist is assisted by a synergist, or maybe even sometimes more than one synergist. And synergist is the name that we give to the muscle, again we're talking about muscles, is the, is, the, is the role of the muscle that is helping the agonist out. So you'll notice on the diagram I've made the box a little bit smaller because usually the synergist is helping the agonist and that synergist is usually a smaller muscle. It's a smaller muscle. It assists with the overall force production but the prime mover is the agonist. The one that's making the main movement, the one that's producing the most contractile force is the agonist and the synergist is there to help out should an, a bit of additional force be needed or should the agonist need to be controlled in some way. So the agonist is contracting, the antagonist is relaxing to allow the movement of the agonist and the agonist is assisted by the synergist. Now, of course, if the synergist is contracting and assisting the movement of the agonist, then the synergist can also only move if the synergist's 
antagonist is relaxing. Because the, some synergists will also have antagonistic muscles that work in the opposite direction to the synergist. So if a synergist is contracting, the synergist's antagonist must also relax. So I've, I've split this arrow here. So as the antagonist relaxes on one side of the joint, that relaxation of the antagonist then allows both the agonist and the synergist or synergists to contract together. And they, as I said here, they contract together to produce um, an overall greater force of contraction. And there are three main ways in which the agonist and the synergist can contract together. And they will always contract in the same way. What do I mean by that? Well, there are basically three main ways, three contraction types that the agonist and the synergist can do as they contract together. So they might contract together isometrically. So an isometric contraction, you'll remember, is a contraction where the origin and the insertion of the muscle don't move. So no movement is created. There's tension in the muscle, but no movement is created. So that would be the sort of uh, contraction we would need in order to hold something still. So maybe holding a weight out in front of us or overhead or to our sides or whatever it might be, but holding something still without movement, without pulling the origin and the insertion either closer together or allowing them to move further apart. The muscle is contracting and the origin and the insertion don't move. That is an isometric contraction. Now, if the agonist is contracting isometrically, then the synergist is also contracting isometrically because they have to join together to fulfill this role. What other kinds of contractions are there? Well, you'll remember from a previous video, but we've also got concentric contractions. So the agonist and the synergist, the synergist is assisting the agonist to produce a greater amount of force where it's needed, and they will always contract together. They will contract either isometrically or concentrically. Now, a concentric contraction is when the origin of the muscle and the insertion of the muscle move closer together. The origin is wherever the end of the muscle that's closest to the midline of the body. And the insertion is the end of the muscle that's furthest away from the midline of the body. So you could say the origin is proximal and the insertion is distal. But in either case, however we define it, if those origin if that origin and insertion are moving closer together under contraction we call that a concentric contraction and again the agonist if the agonist is contracting um to and the agonist is contracting concentrically so is the synergist the synergist is also contracting concentrically and there's one other type of contraction that we need to know about they will contract together the agonist and the synergist the agonist will be assisted by the synergist and they'll contract together either isometrically or concentrically or eccentrically. An eccentric contraction is a contraction where the muscle is under tension, both the agonist and the synergist, if the synergist is there helping out. They will contract and they'll be under tension and yet the origin and the, ins and the insertion will be moving further apart from one another. So the origin and the insertion will be moving apart from one another under contraction. And we use uh, eccentric contractions for sort of slowing down, for breaking movements, uh, for lowering weights down to the ground and that sort of thing. Um, it's what we sometimes call negative phases in, in, in certain movements. So the agonist is the prime mover, but the antagonist has to relax to allow the movement of the agonist. Sometimes the agonist, in fact, quite often the agonist will be assisted by a synergist, which is a smaller muscle. But those two muscles, the agonist and the synergist, are both permitted to move or allowed to move by the relaxation of the antagonist. And they'll both contract together. And as they contract together, they will always contract in the same way. It will either be an isometric contraction where there's no movement of the muscle, despite it being contracted, despite there being tension in the muscle. Or they'll contract concentrically together, where the agonist's origin insertion and also the synergist's origin and insertion move closer together. 
and finally they'll they may contract eccentrically where again the agonists origin and insertion might move apart under tension and at the same time the synergists origin and insertion also may move apart under tension well there's one more thing to note here and that is that there's one more muscle roll so we've mentioned how that when the agonist contracts and likewise a synergist the origin and the insertion either don't move if it's isometric they move closer if it's concentric or they move apart if it's eccentric well if we're trying to isolate a particular muscle movement a particular joint movement caused by an agonist what we can do is we might want to uh, fix the origin of the agonist so the agonist the origin of the agonist is the end of the muscle the attachment of the muscle closest or proximal to the midline of the body and if we do want to fix that um, that that joint or fix that bone that on which the agonist muscle begins the origin of the agonist we would use a muscle called a fixator so the agonist's origin is fixed by a fixator. Now the purpose of the fixator, as I've just said, the purpose of the fixator is to ensure that, that whatever bone the agonist begins on isn't moving so that the movement happens at the insertion of the agonist. Whatever joint it is uh, across which the agonist passes, wherever it inserts, that's where we want the movement at the at the insertion end at the distal end and so in certain movements we will want the the proximal end we will want the origin end of the agonist muscle to be held still and to do that we use uh, a muscle or sometimes uh, several muscles to act as fixators fixators so the agonist's origin is fixed by the fixator muscle now, obviously, if you think about this, if the fixator muscle's role is to fix the origin of the agonist, to hold it still, to hold it in place, then the fixator's role, or the fixator's contraction type, I should say, has to be always isometric. Because for the fixator to hold the agonist's origin still, that is the, the bone or the bones on which the agonist begins, originates, for the fixator to hold that still it has to ensure that that fixator muscle is contracting in such a way that there's no movement of that muscle because we're trying to hold the joint still so the fixator will always if it's doing its role the fixator will always contract isometrically in order to hold the agonist's origin still or fixed in place hence the name the fixator let's do some examples so let's say we're going to um, talk about a bicep curl now in a bicep curl the agonist the prime mover is obviously going to be the biceps brachii the biceps brachii and so there must be a muscle that works on the opposite side of the joint which the biceps brachii is trying to move that has to relax to allow the biceps brachii to make that movement and so I'm sure you know the antagonist to the biceps brachii is the triceps brachii because it's the muscle that's on the other side of the joint, in this case the elbow, that makes the opposite movement. The biceps brachii makes flexion at the elbow, whereas the triceps brachii makes extension at the elbow. So the triceps brachii has to relax to allow the movement of the agonist, which in this case is the biceps brachii. But there are also some smaller muscles around the elbow that are assisting the biceps brachii in making flexion at the elbow. And in this case, the synergists are the brachialis and the brachioradialis. The brachialis and the brachioradialis. And they're smaller muscles, hence being in a smaller box. They're smaller muscles than the biceps brachii, but they assist, they help out. And so once we've got the biceps brachii working, the triceps brachii is relaxed to allow the movement of the biceps brachii. And it's also therefore allowing the movement um, of the brachialis and the brachioradialis, which are adding to the overall force that the biceps brachii is producing. So those muscles all put together can produce a greater force 
uh, of elbow in elbow flexion than the biceps brachii could do on its own. So depending on how they're contracting, if they are, if as we've just said, they're making elbow flexion, then when they contract together, as they always do, all three of them, the biceps brachii, the brachialis and the brachioradialis, all three of them will be contracting concentrically because we're pulling the origin and the insertion of all three of those muscles closer together in order to flex, uh, produce flexion at the elbow. Now, of course, it's also possible for the um, biceps brachii, the brachialis and the brachioradialis to contract together isometrically. That might be holding uh, a weight out in front of you with your elbow in partial flexion and, and holding it there and not moving, in which case those three muscles are contracting together isometrically. It's also possible, for example, on the downwards phase of a bicep curl. So upwards, it would be a concentric contraction. And then on the downwards phase, the muscle would lengthen, but it would still be contracted as we lower the weight down again. That would uh, be an eccentric contraction of all three of those muscles. The biceps brachii as the agonist and the brachialis and brachioradialis as the synergist. They're all moving in the same type of contraction. So they all have they all have the same type of contraction together, whether it's isometric, concentric, or eccentric. So if we want then to move on to this this last muscle role in this in this um, this example, the biceps brachii example, um, you you'll know hopefully that the biceps brachii crosses the elbow, but it also crosses the shoulder joint. So actually, it's um, it's a dual joint muscle. It's it, it crosses two joints. It crosses both the elbow and also it crosses uh, across the shoulder joint and attaches. It originates, I should say, it originates uh, on the scapula. So the biceps brachio actually originates its proximal end. Its tendon connects to the scapula. So if we want to do a bicep curl, ideally we want to do our bicep curl um, and have all the movement occur at the elbow. So in order to do that, to ensure that all the movement occurs at the elbow, we need to fix the origin of the biceps brachii. So fixing the origin of the biceps brachii in this case means fixing the scapula. And there are various muscles around the scapula, around the shoulder that could be the fixator here. There are several that, that participate in this role, but the one we're going to focus on, or that in fact it's a small group of muscles that we're going to focus on, are the rotator cuff muscles. So deep inside your shoulder, um, very close in onto the scapula itself, um, are a, a small group of relatively small but very important muscles, the rotator cuff muscles. And if we can have those rotator cuff muscles contracting isometrically inside, deep inside the shoulder, then we will be holding still the origin of the biceps brachii. If we can hold the shoulder joint still by using the rotator cuff, we might use some other muscles around it as well, but uh, let's not bother ourselves with that just now. The rotator cuff will mainly be responsible for holding the scapula still. We're holding the origin of the biceps brachii still so that when the biceps brachii contracts, the movement is produced not in the shoulder, but in the elbow. Let's really quickly do one more then. Let's say we wanted to uh, make flexion at the knee joint flexion at the knee joint. Um, what's the main agonist? What's the prime mover that would help us make flexion at the knee joint? Well, I'm hoping you'll know that it's the hamstrings. So the hamstrings on the, the back of the femur are predominantly responsible for flexion at the knee joint. Now, I'm not going to divide them up and talk about the individual hamstrings uh, at this point, but we'll, we'll group them together for now. So the hamstrings are making flexion at the knee joint. So what muscle is it on the opposite side of the knee joint that would make the opposite movement? Hopefully, you know, it's the quadriceps. Again, we're not going to split those into their, um, their four separate muscles. Let's talk about them generally. So the hamstrings on one side of the femur, quadriceps on the other side of the femur. The quadriceps need to relax in order to allow the hamstrings to produce flexion at the knee joint. Now, the hamstrings are actually assisted um, by more than one muscle to make knee flexion. The one I'm going to uh, mentioned as a synergist in, in this particular example is the gastrocnemius. Now the gastrocnemius predominant role is to um, is to produce plantar flexion at the ankle but because it also crosses the knee it can be used as a synergist to the hamstrings in knee flexion. 
So the hamstrings and the gastrocnemius are working together. They're contracting together and they're moving because the quadriceps has allowed them to move because the quadriceps is relaxed to allow that movement. So whatever contraction we have from the hamstrings and the gastrocnemius, it will be the same contraction. They'll contract together. It'll either be isometric, in which case the knee joint won't be moving, but yet it will be under tension. It might be concentric, in which case the knee joint is making flexion, or it might be eccentric, in which case the knee joint is making extension, but under control of the hamstrings. So it could be any of those three. It may be that we want to isolate that movement. If we wanted to isolate the knee flexion movement, we would need to fix the origin of the hamstrings. Okay, so we would need to fix the bone on which the hamstrings begin, and that's the pelvis. So if we wanted to fix the pelvis, the fixator muscle for that would be the gluteals. So the, the glutes around the hip joint would fix the pelvis to stop the hip from moving to allow the hamstring to produce flexion at the knee joint. Now, if we were running or jumping or something, we actually wouldn't want the glutes to do this. Um, because we, we actually, to run and to jump and so on, we actually do also need movement in the hip joint. But if we're trying to isolate it, uh, let's say we're trying to particularly focus on it in, a, in, in the gym, we're doing hamstring curls or something, then yes, in that case, we would want to fix the origin of the hamstrings. We want to fix the hip joint, um, fix the pelvis in place so there's no movement, so all the movement occurs in the knee joint. In that case, if we wanted to do that, we would need the glutes to contract and we would need them to contract without movement. So we'd need them to contract isometrically. Well, that's it for this video. Don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification icon so you get notified every time I upload uh, new videos. But I hope that's been useful to you. If you've got any questions, please leave them in the comments and I'll definitely get back to you. But until next time, take care for now.